Urban Squeeze. And on Drive, joined by our two favourite urban planners, Dr Tony Matthews, Associate Professor Jason Byrne, urban planners with the School of Environment at Griffith University. Gentlemen, hello to you. Good afternoon, Hi, Matt. Good to have you back again. Now, you want to talk about smart cities today. I reckon it's smart cities and the Gold Coast of 2050 that occupy the uh, the conversations are just about every breakfast that ever takes place. I actually wonder what how many ex Benedicts have been consumed while talking about these things here on the Gold Coast, and it doesn't just remind me a little bit of Utopia. Well done, everyone. We inherited a project people have been trying to get up for forty years. Woo! Nothing's stopping us. Yeah, yeah. Okey dokey. I'm a little cynical when it comes to smart cities. Is my cynicism warranted? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, think you, I think you're right there. Please. Okay, thanks for coming in today, gents. <laughs> yeah, see you next week. <laughs> Quick segment today. <laughs> Look, smart cities, are obviously a younger population here moving and changing the Gold Coast. Uh, it's a fairly fresh piece of geography in terms of an urban environment, um, it's probably ripe to be almost an experimental setter, a centre of of the so-called smart city model. Um, what is a smart city? What do we need to aspire to? And how smart do we need to be? I, I suppose they're the questions. They are the magic questions, aren't they? And Tony and yeah. I have been having a bit of a chat about this. And you know, what's the difference between innovation versus smart city? Mm -hmm. I thought we might start there. So... I've heard this idea of an innovation city being about the successful exploitation of new ideas. So not just having a new idea, but actually successfully exploiting those ideas. The the kind of metaphor is that um, you can imagine a business where you go to your boss and you say, I've got this great new idea. And if the boss goes, okay, well, off you go and do it. Mm -hmm. It's never going to get done versus, oh, that's fantastic. How can we make that happen? So it's that second idea of how we can make it happen. Um, it's also been described that the city is a kind of serendipity engine where the accidental discoveries happen all the time through this kind of contact with people, that sort of stuff. I really say that like again, that a serendipity engine. A serendipity engine. engine. Isn't that a great, <laughs> great kind of quote? Yeah, that's pretty groovy. <laughs> pretty. It should be on the side of a combi van, yeah, shouldn't it? Yeah, should. It? I used to have a combi, so maybe that's where it's coming from. I owned a couple too. We'll talk about that another time, another um, segment. Indeed. So... <laughs> There's kind of this idea of diversifying economies through science and technology and these knowledge-based economies. Um, there's an innovation cities index, just like there's been all these livable cities indexes. Um, they're based on the number of patents per capita or whether, whether you've got international airports, uh, your, your kind of quality of your public transit system, um, your efficiency with resources, levels of consumption, whether you've got a skilled labour force, this sort of stuff, right? Uh, so Brisbane comes in at 57 on that Global Innovation Index out of the top 500. And the Gold Coast, interestingly, comes in at number 187. Eek. Um, the That's 130 spots this separated is... by 80 kilometres. Yeah. Uh, let's, you know, let's, let's give credit where credit is due. Brisbane's been a, a, a city for a lot longer than the Gold Coast has. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the Gold Coast is a relatively recent construction in city terms. I mean, you had all of these coastal towns all along, but actually bringing them together under the administrative banner of a city was, was, it, was, it was a very different departure for, for, for Gold Coast City. So Brisbane's had the jump in, in, in almost for a century now. So yeah. it's probably, okay. you know, it, it doesn't reflect badly on the Gold Coast. It, no. it, and fair to say, too, Brisbane's fairly motivated in this space, aren't they? They've got a fairly supportive council of, uh, uh, forward thinking council, if you like. Am I making that up? Or? No, you're right. And, you know, they're pushing that kind of Brisbane metro at the moment yep. and how to get that on board. Um, they're very good at le leveraging investment from the state government, or have been until recently. <laughs> um, but, you know, when we're looking at the top cities in the world, these are cities like London or San Francisco, Singapore, Tokyo, New York. So to, to come in at 187 is not too bad. So that's that's innovation. But, Tony, there's smart cities as well, right? And they're a bit different. Smart cities are a little bit different. Um, smart cities are cities that use technology... Uh, IT and communications technology specifically in order to improve their urban conditions or their urban functions. So there are cities that, for example, use sensors to track real-time 
uh, traffic data or weather data. Um, there are cities that track uh, climate changes during the day. The city gets hotter or colder. Mm. Um, they are cities that, for example, if there's some sort of an emergency breaks out, it's there's sensors all around the city that tell you exactly where it's happening, what's happening, and then start sending out texts to people that are in the area, advising them how to get out of the area, not just in general terms, but in specific terms based on their actual location. So this is beyond a theoretical construct. This sort of stuff happens now. Oh, it's yeah, already so happening, yeah. In yeah. Brazil, and right? Brazil, and, but probably led most, most particularly by Singapore, um, Singapore is what, what's known as a brownfield smart city, which means that they have retrofitted this technology onto the existing city. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got brownfield and greenfield smart cities. Greenfield ones are ones that are built brand new to be smart cities. There's a few examples of them. Uh, for example, there's a place called Songdo in South Korea, which is a, a, a greenfield smart city. It was okay. built to be a smart city. Whereas Singapore, what they've done is they've just deployed hundreds of thousands of sensors all over the city. And they can, I mean, the level of detail these sen sensors receive uh, and transmit is, is incredible. I mean, building heights, building materials, numbers of windows, levels of glare, reflectivity, traffic volume, numbers of people. I mean, very, Gee. very, very specific data, which is, that's my, one of my major concerns with this whole movement is the amount of data that is collected and tracked and utilized uh, and analyzed and then presumably fed back to the companies that develop the software and technology to begin with. And that really worries me. Oh, it's sounding a bit like a Bond plot. There yeah, brewing. And, and you know we've got these kind of greenfield cities like um, Tony is talking about. So Mazda, Mazda Eco City in the um, in the Middle East has been given an exa as an example. They've built that city from the ground up. It's quite small still, but they've got hectare after hectare of solar panels that power this. They've got labs that are monitoring it the whole time. They're testing building construction and design under heat. This sort of stuff. But after the global financial crisis. Uh, they had to basically go back to fossil fuel dependency for a while, and so it had been heavily criticised as being not very successful. Same with this Korean example, right, Tony? Yeah, well, um, Mazda, was, you know, that was a purpose-designed city that was intended to be carbon neutral. It was supposed to be a sort of a, a, an exemplar of how to build a city that is environmentally friendly and takes advantage of renewable technologies and mm. doesn't have emissions and things like that. And as Jason said, they hit a bump in the road with the GFC, and they decided that actually this is a bit expensive and maybe there's not a market demand for it. We should probably put some fossil fuel dependent stuff in here, and that's why they fall down. Songdo in South Korea is criticized by many people for being soulless, for not having any real vibe about it, for f just feeling very empty and technological, even though there's lots of people living and working there. There's a, a criticism of the place that it feels very disconnected and, and like living within a machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we just heard the mayor talking about the, um, he was asked to put his, uh, well, the, the feasibility um, the process is continuing on for this offshore uh, shipping terminal idea, uh, but he was asked to list his priorities and I was interested, for right or wrong, uh, to hear him list the arts and cultural precinct as priority number one. And I'm seeing a merger of ideas here in what you were just talking about, Tony. The, you know, the arts, the arts and culture industry in this country actually employs more people than the mining industry does. And so what the arts and culture industry is not doing well is public relations relative to the mining industry. But they are actually a bigger national driver than, than mining, and they employ more people. Uh, and it has a huge amount of value, not just in terms of a, the national production and consumption of arts and culture, but also as an export um, commodity, uh, exporting Australian media, movies, uh, music, literature, uh, any, kind of, uh, any, any kind of creative enterprise. Uh, can be potentially exported. So that industry is actually very, very big nationally. So in a sense, it's not particularly surprising. It's actually very heartening, but not necessarily surprising to hear that the mayor has flagged that. And increasingly, and this goes back to Jason's Innovation Cities mm. uh, stuff, a lot of the entrepreneurialism and the activity and the, um, the new development that happens in the arts and culture scene is actually led from the ground up. And if you can, as a city, provide a supportive... Uh, um, culture for that from local government down that recognizes the value of that and tries to promote and um, and, and nurture that, you can actually leverage enormous return from that, um, which uh, we were talking about that earlier, Jason. We were. And so, you know, you've got this kind of problem with smart cities where it's driven from the top, the Fortune 500 companies, you know, IBM and uh, Samsung and how can they cash in and take advantage of labor forces, this sort of stuff. The innovation actually comes from the grassroots, the small incubators, the, the Miami Marquetta sort of stuff down mm. the road, right, where people have said, I'm not very happy with the level of culture on the Gold Coast. How can we get an incubator together? How can we bring in artists and 
performance artists as well as people who are working on new apps and app design and new kinds of dresses and, and this sort of stuff, 3D printing dresses, for example. Mm, right? mm. Um, and how can we then leverage off that to build a place? And this is what planning is really about, is this idea of place making. So the, the kind of top-down level stuff can be very soulless, like Tony was saying, the innovative stuff from the grassroots can be very vibrant and can generate huge returns to the economy. Oh, a big time. I used to live in a place in, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, uh, I've said it before, I'm from Ireland. I'm from a city in Ireland called Cork, which is the second city in Ireland. Um, and I lived in an area of Cork called Shandon, um, which is a really cool inner city area, but for years was allowed to sort of stagnate and, 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 and the council had no real vision for it. There was no planning vision for it. Nothing was happening with it. Occasionally, a, uh, an idea would come along and go nowhere. Uh, and when I was living there, uh, a group of residents and traders and, and, and people who understood the space innately got together and said well how can we drive this area forward from a community level and since that happened there have been a number of amazing initiatives not least a thing called the dragon of shandon halloween parade which is now probably i would venture for my money probably the best halloween parade in all of europe <laughs> and it was it was led from the ground Don't up talk about clowns whatever you yeah, yeah that right. <laughs> but um you know so for years, that whole area stagnated and, and council didn't know what to do with it. As soon as people who lived in the area said, well, we've got an idea and we think it can work and we've already got a critical mass. What we need now is support from you guys. It started to take off. And we're seeing this in cities all around the world. Uh, and this is that innovation agenda. So what, what, what planners need to do and what city managers need to do is be a little bit more flexible in their planning. Be prepared to receive ideas that are sent up the chain rather than coming down the chain. Mm. And, and as Jason says, ask the question, what can we do for you? How can we help you? Rather than saying, that's a good idea, go for it. You know, what can we specifically do? Can we give you space to work in? Can we give you equipment? Uh, can we give you free broadband? What can we do to realize your idea so that the city benefits from it? Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I, I sort of, I've got this little uh, anecdote or, or analogy brewing in my mind about um, owl boxes. Uh, you may not have an owl in your tree out the back of your house you build an owl box pop it up there you'll get an owl within days you know they just turn up you've we just got just, to give it an opportunity and we were just talking about this so uh across australia in the not too distant future we're going to be littered with some very large buildings that masters has moved out of right mm. they've basically gone gone bust they're liquidating all their stock what's going to happen to those buildings so in cities like detroit where you've had that kind of abandonment it did can you say to detroit Boom, 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 boom. Gonna shoot you right down. I was hoping you were going to mention Detroit. Glad John Lee Hooker's from Detroit. You were very quick with that cue. <laughs> I had it lined so up. So impressed. It was pre-existing. I saw it in one of the lists of uh, Detroit as a smart city, whereas my mental image of it is a place of decay. But, and abandonment. And right? abandonment. But where there is that, of course, there's opportunity. Yeah, we were talking last week about green cities and urban greening, and Detroit's becoming increasingly known for that sort of stuff. Um, and this is where smart cities don't work so well, is they're often... They create inequality. Detroit's rebounding from the ground up. But if we look at Masters, it's, there's going to be a real example there of potential where these large buildings that are going to lie empty could go two ways. They could become neighbourhood blights. They could lower property values. They could be filled with graffiti and broken mm. windows, all that kind of stuff. Or you could land up looking at them as a space for incubators. You know, what if we got creative industries in there? What if we landed up creating uh, hackathons? Hackathons are a really What's interesting a idea. Yeah, so this is where people who can now open source blueprints and plans and this kind of stuff come together in a short period, usually over a weekend, to smash out a new product. So they might be downloading um, circuit prints, they might be 3D printing components, building those in real time, checking them, seeing if they work coming together with a new product and then bringing that to market. Right? Yeah, right. So they do that. A bit like a pop-up store, you yeah. know, filling that short-term yeah, lease yeah. need, that right. kind of thing. So it's really enabling this kind of um, innovation from the grassroots and supporting that and helping it happen. And enabling is the word, isn't it? You, you bring in rules and bylaws and legislation that, allows for stuff rather than disallows it. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and as, as I said earlier, and I think Jason would agree, absolutely, the key here is flexibility. Mm. You, you mm. know, it is to have a flexible uh, urban management system and a planning system that can respond to this because this stuff is invariably citizen-led and you can either respond to it and positively uh, um, help it along its way or you can you can sort of be inflexible and top-down and, and very, very prescriptive about it and it'll just fizzle out. It's fascinating to me that the word we constantly get, perhaps in this organisation, Organization, but definitely in others is agility and it's very much a top-down kind of idea you 
I say from up here at the top of the pyramid, you down near the base of the pyramid, you must be agile. You must expect to be agile in the future. But uh, asking agility from those above you is as equally important. The arrows should go both ways. Yeah, and asking they? cities to be agile in a sense is what we're talking about here with this kind of innovation city. So mm. a good example is, uh, you know, we've got buses at the moment that <laughs> if you catch a bus, you're going to relate to this. They're pretty hopeless for running on time. That's often because the traffic is really jammed up. And we have these rigid timetables that we have to work to, right? Well, those buses have GPS systems. Why don't we link that to an app on your phone? There's other parts of the world which are doing this now where you can request real time, I would like a bus to be here at this stop. This is when I'm going to be there. And then you don't have to wait. When you go to the stop, the next bus that's coming past stops at the stop because it's expecting you. It comes up on a little screen, mm. the driver pulls over. But if there's no one at the stop, they don't have to constantly be monitoring that stop, seeing if they pull over or not it means the system becomes more efficient and it's user-driven, right, rather than this kind of rigid timetable-driven approach. And while uh, talking about traffic, just hold that thought. Coast traffic on 91.7 ABC Gold Coast. So absorbed was I in the discussion, Brad, I didn't see the light flashing. Hello. Oh, I was absorbed as well. And uh, look, buses could be a little slow on Reedy Creek Road at the moment. We did have an eastbound crash at Burley Heads and Maddox Road. That's been cleared. We are seeing delays in that stretch now. And everyone on the M1 southbound, Rundle to Mullen Diner and also through Rabina. Also Avenue southbound delays through Ash more approaching Southport and Narang Road and plenty of traffic on Bundle Road in both directions through Bundle around Ashmore Road. I'm Brad, more traffic before 5, 91.7 ABC Gold. Thank you very much, Brad. More from Brad a little later on news headlines approaching rapidly. Uh, Dr Tony Matthews with me, Associate Professor Jason Byrne as well. Urban Squeeze, talking urban planning, smart cities in particular. What about the Gold Coast? Yeah, so Where are we at? The Gold Coast is actually not doing too badly. Like we mentioned at the beginning of the segment, we're about 187 on this Smart Cities Index. There's the beginning of what's been called a health and knowledge precinct that maybe Tony can talk about in a second mm. in a little bit more detail. But, you know, we've got things like innovations in drug discovery, advances in food science, advanced manufacturing with that 3D printing we mentioned before, where people are even 3D printing guitars now, mm. right? Um, we've got ICT, uh, information communication technology, animatronics. We, we build animatronics robots here like dinosaurs mm -hmm. for movies that sort of stuff uh, fitness and health there's a very thriving movie industry and a marine precinct that's often talked about as well mm. the question is how do we take these disparate scattered kind of things and bring them together to generate that kind of serendipity engine that we mentioned before put them all in an empty masters factory yeah masters. A little bit, right and right and get that energy <laughs> springing off so tony you've got some some things that we were talking about before right with regard to this kind of health and knowledge precinct well yeah so the the gold coast health and knowledge precinct which is um uh coincidentally where griffith uh griffith's campus is as well i mean that's a really good example because what you have there is you have uh, a knowledge precinct built around a university which is expanding uh, a new hospital the commonwealth games village the Athletes Village will be converted into housing post-com games. And then to top it all off, it's located in what we call a transit-orientated development, which means it's a development that's developed around uh, a good quality public transport line because mm. and in this case, it's it's the light rail, of course. So the, the Gold Coast light rail, even right now, comes right up to the Health and Knowledge Precinct. Once phase two is finished, it'll connect, of course, to Helens Vale to the heavy rail. But right now you can you can you can live at Surfers or you can you know, you can you can live along the coast and you can you can take the, the into the knowledge precinct uh, and you have all of this activity going on there and you have the idea is cross-pollination between the various activities so there's something going on in terms of medical research it may be at Griffith that is in partnership with the hospital looking for some sort of mutual discovery that will benefit both um, researchers and and patients um, you know so you've, you've all of this going on so th this kind of co-location and bringing various uh, um, types of activity together, professional activity together in, in under the banner of a precinct with a specific strategic aim is a really good thing. And the Gold Coast is doing that really, really well with the Health and Knowledge Precinct. Oh, that's good and it's hear. going to get better. Mm -hmm. uh, and just as another shout out to the Gold Coast, they're now a member of the Open and Agile Smart Cities Network. That which agile word. Open and Agile. There you go. You know, it's another management word. But, um, uh, Put this it is on the whiteboard. This is, yes. yeah. 
um, some management consultant got, uh, got wealthy on that. <laughs> oh, um, but this is a, a, an international organization where cities have come together to voluntarily share their discoveries. So if one city develops a piece of software that has good credentials for having a, soft, mm. a, a smart city, say, around transport management or something like that, the, the knowledge and the, the um, uh, uh, technology gets shared with the other cities. So it avoids duplication. It, it, I, I remember you saying this a few weeks ago, Jason, that better to cooperate than compete. And Absolutely. That's, that's what's that's happening uh, with that particular organization. And Gold Coast City is in that now. That's good. I mean, you know, if we kind of leverage off this uh, public transport we were talking about, if the light rail eventually goes through to the airport, as we're hoping it will, that's when sparks really start to fly, right? Because you're enabling that kind of cluster of innovation to be connected internationally, not just in terms of internet connection, but real time being able to fly to Singapore, for example back the next day after you've shared this thing, been to a conference, that sort of stuff. And that's where cities really begin to take off. Needs a funding leap of faith. It does, does it? indeed. And better broadband. <laughs> and a crowd, crowd sharing, well, we, crowdsourcing. We didn't even get on to that yet about the basic nuts and bolts required to make things work. But as always, we can fold that into another chat on another day. Gents, it's always good. good having you in. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Thanks, fascinating Matt. stuff. Tony Matthews, Dr. Tony Matthews, Associate Professor Jason Byrne from the School of Environment at Griffith University. The Urban Squeeze, done and dusted for another week. See you next time. See you next time.